Okay, so we shall continue with uh, the topic of cryptographic hash functions which we started last day. So we were essentially discussing about the relative order of hardness of security criteria for hash functions. So we will continue with that and then discuss about a particular type of construction which is very much popular. It is called the Merkle Damgard construction and it is also uh, it is an iterated construction technique for hash functions. Okay, so we will discuss about these topics. So to start with, we have discussed about these two reductions. We are discussing about these two reductions. We are discussing about the collision to second pre-image problem. So that we discussed last day, and uh, we will be discussing about the collision to pre-image problem. Okay. So so one thing actually that we were uh, considering these type of reductions, and there were some queries like why do we put this if right? So one reason is because this is also a probabilistic algorithm. Right, so therefore, this doesn't always give you the answer. So it gives you the answer sometimes. It does not give you the answer sometimes. So therefore, for example, this is a La Vega algorithm, La Vega randomized algorithm. So therefore, this can fail also. Right. So when this algorithm fails, then this collision to second preimage also fails. Right. So therefore, this this if is only to check whether this actually gives you a answer or not. Therefore, that means that in case of a La Vega algorithm, whether it terminates or not. Okay, and there is a probability of it terminating and the probability is denoted by epsilon. So if that is the probability then the probability with which this collision to second preimage also gives you a correct answer is also epsilon okay and that is the precise reason why this if was kept actually. But again uh, as we discussed in the last day's class we do not require to check for x and x dash being equal or not because since this is correctly giving an answer for the second preimage problem. Therefore, this is automatically taken care of. Okay, so this is uh, something that we have discussed, and we are discussing about this particular reduction. So, therefore, this is a collision to pre-image problem. So, we know that pre-image problem means given h x, we have to return an x value for which the hash value are the same, right? That is the pre-image problem. So, we assume that there is a solution to this pre-image problem, and from there we show that in that case. <coughs> We have we can also solve the collision. I mean, we can also solve the collision problem. Okay, so therefore, if this is the question that is, if you are uh, you are choosing x at random, uniformly at random, and then you compute the hash value that is h x value, and then engage the algorithm pre for computing the pre image. So therefore, this is an oracle which to which you are asking a question. Okay, and uh, it gives you back an x dash. So one thing you have to now check. Is whether x and x dash are same or not, right? Because this give, just gives you the pre image. So, therefore, you do this check that is whether x dash and x are same or not. If they are not same, then you can return x, comma x dash because both of them has the same, both of them have the same hash value and they are also not equal, right? So, therefore, this is a solution to your collision problem as well, right? So, now the question is that what is that if I assume that the oracle pre image is a 1, comma q La Vega algorithm, so that means 1, comma q means. The probability of giving you the pre image solution is actually a 1, is actually 1, and there are q queries required. Then, what is the corresponding epsilon value and number of queries required for this collision to pre image oracle? Okay, so number of queries you can easily see that if this query is q, and since there is an extra query, it is q plus 1. Okay, and about the probability, we will make an assumption. So, the assumption is as follows that is, the cardinality of x is twice greater than the cardinality of y. Then we can show that you have actually uh, a probability of half comma q plus one. Okay. So in order to understand that, let us uh, consider a proof. So the proof works as like like this. So consider the space. Okay. So consider the space of x. Okay. So now what we start doing is that we start partitioning this space. So we start inducing partitions so you know that we can induce partitions by equivalence relations right so therefore we can start inducing partitions we start partitioning this set such that all the values which lies in one partition they have got the same hash value okay so that means that if there are two values like x1 and x2 which is one partition then h of x1 and h of x2 are the same Okay, so that is the definition of a partition. Okay, in this case, so now consider that uh, 
So therefore, now let us consider that suppose uh, how many such partitions are there. So therefore, the number of partitions which will be there. So I call them suppose all of them are some collections. Okay. So therefore, suppose this is one C1, this is C2, this is C3, and so on. Then the number of such collections will be equal to the cardinality of y because all all of the partitions are indicating one one particular hash value. So therefore, the number of collision uh, number of collections is actually equal to the cardinality of y. Okay. So now let us consider that suppose there is a given value of x. So suppose you have been provided with a with an x value. What is the probability of success with which you are actually solving the collision problem? So your probability of success will be actually equal to. So how many total number of so given x? How many total values are there? So there are actually if I call this as a, I mean the the equivalence class, I mean for so there is basically one partition. If I indicate by this symbol, then the cardinality of this is the total number of possible values which I can choose from, right? Among them, except one, all of them are my correct values because one will be the same value, right? So you you understand what I'm saying? So suppose let us consider one particular partition, okay? So suppose you you are considering this partition, okay? And suppose x lies in this partition. So in that case, when you are asking the pre-image to give you a result, the pre-image is giving you a result with a probability of one. The pre-image oracle, we have assumed that it has it is a Lavig algorithm with probability one, right? So therefore, it will definitely solve the pre-image problem, and it will return you some value, right? So what are the possible values which it can return? It can return the number of values which are lying in this partition, right? And what is that set? So I indicate the number by equivalence by equivalence of x and the cardinality of that, right? So apart from, I mean, in that, except for the number x itself or the value x itself, all are correct values for the collision problem, right? So therefore, your probability of success, if you are given this value of x, is this. Any doubts? So now we need to consider the average case probability right so therefore what we will do if i am interested in the average probability then I, what i will do is that i will take it over the entire set right so therefore i will do a sigma operation of this and i will do it i will vary the x over the entire set x right so this we can actually write in this fashion i can first of all so there are so many collections right so let us break this sigma into two sigmas and in the in this particular sigma let us concentrate that x is belonging to one particular collection okay and here the collection belongs to all possible collection sets okay so let's see be the collection set which is comprising of say C1, C2 and so on. So how many total collections are there? C cardinality of y, right? So therefore consider that this is your total collection set and therefore you know that this is how you, what you are doing, right? So therefore what is what does this value compute to? This is the number of elements in the corresponding, in the corresponding collection C and therefore this is also cardinality of C minus 1. right hmm? so therefore this will compute to now 1 by cardinality of x and this if i keep this sigma so this uh, will be for all the values of x which lies in cardinality of c so how many values are there? The cardinality of C values, and this value is a constant. So you get cardinality of C minus one, right? And this computes to therefore one by x. I can break this into cardinality of C, where C lies to this cardinality of set minus sigma one, 
okay this also is is denominator working so therefore c is again varying what this cardinality is set of c so therefore what does this what what does the first term compute to it computes to mod x and what does the second term compute to mod y mod y because for each collection you are getting a 1 right so this computes to mod y so therefore this is nothing but mod of x minus mod of y divided by mod of x so now you see that we have actually made one assumption in the theorem which says that mod of x is greater than twice of mod of y okay so if i assume this and this is quite a practical assumption to make okay so in that case mod of x is greater than twice of mod of y if i assume this then i then this particular thing is greater than half right so therefore your probability of success is at least equal to half right so you note one thing that whenever we are doing this kind of reductions or the reductions that we have discussed in the class we have assumed the ideal hash function assumption okay we assume that the hash functions are ideal so basically all these proofs that we have shown are under the random oracle model okay so if the random oracle model is violated then these proofs or these reductions may not hold true so we have to be careful okay so what was the ideal hash function model the main main assumption was that if i need to compute a new hash value <coughs> how many previous hash values you have computed if you are computing the hash for a new input then you have to again compute it previous value should not help you right very informally this was the meaning okay, <coughs> okay. so now you can actually ponder upon a point it says that if the oracle pre image has a success probability of epsilon which is less than 1 then what is the minimum probability of success of collision to pre image algorithm so we can just think on this actually okay so so now we go into the construction of iterated hash functions and uh, we will take up a particular type of construction which is known as the markel damgard construction okay so the idea is that you have got a compression function so all these iterated hash functions has got an underlying concept that is there is a compression function which means that it takes a large number of values and it compresses to a small output bits okay and using this we will iterate this so that my domain actually becomes infinite and my output is still constant okay so therefore now if you see this slide express uh, extending a compression function to a hash function with an infinite domain so that is the objective of the iterated algorithm okay so a hash function is created in this fashion is called an iterated hash function so we will consider a hash function whose inputs and outputs are bit strings which means they are 0 1 values and again so you know this that okay we know this that mod x i mean i mean denotes the length of a bit string x and this particular symbol is a concatenation symbol okay so x concatenated y will be represented in this fashion so x is a string y is a string and we concatenate in this form okay so these are some notations so now let's start the algorithm okay so therefore the basic concept behind this construction is that you have got a compressed function okay so which means that you have got a compress block which will take in say an m plus t bits and will give you a 0 1 m bit output okay so therefore this is a compression function okay so t is typically greater than or equal to 1 okay so therefore now uh, what you will what, what you will do is that your input x can be actually quite large and using that you are computing the hash value right so the first thing which you do is that you have got the input string x okay which you actually you can think that this is actually you can actually break this break them into blocks okay so what you can do is that you can break them into sub blocks such that each block okay is actually divisible by t so or rather is equal to t okay so therefore you understand that in the last block there can be some values 
I mean it, it is not exactly equal to t. So therefore what you do is that you do a padding okay. So you extend this and you make it also equal to t okay. So this particular step is actually called the pre-processing step okay. So therefore what you do is that you make you take x and you make the, uh, the output of this particular pre-processing step a multiple of the size of that block a multiple of t okay. So therefore you see that uh, what you do is that you take an input string x where mod x is greater than equal to m plus t plus 1 and the output string y is such that mod of y is actually equal to 0 mod t which means it is divisible by t and y you are actually breaking up like y1, y2 and so on till yr. So therefore r I mean for each block is, is, is actually equal to t. So that means r into t should be the cardinality of y okay. So cardinality of y means the number of bits which are there in the block y okay. So then you have got certain steps I mean you do an sort of an iterated algorithm. So therefore what you do is that you, you, do, you, you take one steps that is you start computing with y. So now you have got this y. So this y has got each of the blocks as size of size of t right and you have got the compressed function which takes m plus t bits and gives you m bit output okay. So what you do is that now to this compressed function okay you feed in t bits from y and you feed in m bits. So you start with say something which I called as an iv or an initialization vector okay. So now this will result in an m bit output right. So this m bit output what I am doing is that I am passing on as my first uh, as uh, as some parameter okay. So some parameter which means suppose I can call that as uh, z z1 okay. So next what I do is that I take this m bit and I take the next t bits from y and again I pass that to my compressed function and I again obtain another m bits I call that z2 okay. So similarly I keep on repeating this process. <coughs> the final compressed step which you obtain also will therefore result in an m bit output right. So this particular output which is uh, let us write that as zr because there are r blocks of y okay. This zr is sometimes called the hash function output or zr is often given uh, an optional transformation like for example gzr and that is actually called hx okay. So g is optional which means that you can either make it an identity function or you can have a g transformation yeah. This m bit is actually fed to the compress. Okay, so therefore this compress now has got an m plus t bits of input and it also results in an m bit output okay. This is the way you keep on iterating this process right. So therefore this final zr which you obtain like you are exporting some values like z1, z2 and so on this rth value that is zr is sometimes given an optional transformation sometimes not optional means sometimes you do not give it. So therefore gzr is actually called hx okay. So this is the basic idea behind iterated hash functions and uh, so this is what I have already told to you. So you can uh, go back and look into this slide but uh, so let us consider one a typical pre-processing step okay. So therefore what it does is that uh, if you see that you have got y and you have got x. So one, one what you do is that you concatenate it with pad x okay. So pad, pad x is nothing but a simple padding function. So it generally has the value of mod x okay and what you do is that you pad it to the left with additional zeros so that the sum is a multiple of t. So this is a very simple step which I have already told you okay. So now you note one thing that I mean the main thing is that to be noted here is that this pre-processing step has to be an injective function. So what does injective function mean? It has to be a one to one transformation okay. Why? Because if it is not a one to one transformation then I can concentrate on this pre-processing step itself and create a collision right. 
So collision creating should be quite easy in that case. So therefore, I have to ensure that the pre-processing step is actually a one-to-one -one mapping. Okay. So, so therefore, you note that the pre-processing step has to be injective, and therefore, you see that mod of y, that is the number of values in y, is actually equal to R t, which is greater than the value of number of values in x. Okay. So this is necessary for one-to-one -one transformation, right? This cannot be lesser than mod of x. Okay. So these are some minor points. So now we come into the original Markel Damgaard construction and let us concentrate upon this. So this is basically the same iterated hash function uh, technique only, but slightly there are some small minor changes, okay. So let us concentrate. So what you do is that again you use the complex function which is an m plus t b 2 m bits. So this is a collision resistant and this is used to construct a collision resistant hash function. So therefore you see that the domain of your hash function is actually an arbitrary size 0 1 string. And from there, you are obtaining a 0, 1 m bit output. Okay. The main advantage of using or main elegance of using the Markel Damgaard construction is that it gives you a wonderful, wonderful proof. Okay. So, the proof idea is like this. So, uh, okay, before I go into the proof, I will discuss about the construction, but I will just give you the idea behind the, I mean, what I mean by the term proof. Okay. So, proof means that, so your problem is now to create a hash function which is collision resistant, right. So now this is a quite big problem because you are, what you are saying is that you will take a very large string and you will compress that into a small m bit string, right, and which has to be still collision resistant. So the beauty of this Markel Damgaard construction is that it reduces this problem to the collision resistance of the compressed function, okay. So the compressed function is a much smaller problem, right, it is just an m plus t bit input which you are compressing into an m bit output. Okay, and it gives you a proof that if you are able to make a compressed function which is not collision resistant or rather which is collision resistant, then your hash function is also collision resistant. Okay. So that is the basic elegance of the Markel Damgaard construction. Right. So now let us go through the steps of the construction before going into the proof. So you see that x is again taken as a k bit value like x1, x2 and so on. So all of them are in this case, I mean all the size of each particular block is actually equal to t minus 1. So it is not t as we saw in the general overview of the construction, okay. So it is actually equal to t minus 1 and in the last, the last block is actually of size of t minus 1 minus d. So in order to make it t minus 1 size, what do I have to do? I have to add d zeros, okay. So therefore, in this case, the size of d has to be lesser than equal to is actually lesser than equal to t minus two. Okay, that's the way how you are breaking it. Okay, so so therefore, how, what is the value of k? So k will be in this case, you already have your size as n, but if you have padded that with d blocks, it becomes n plus d, right? So therefore, n plus d divided by t minus one should be the value of k, right? And that you can represent as seal of n divided by t minus 1, right. So now let us see the construction, okay. So construction, you have to go through this uh, algorithm little bit. So you see that 0, 1 m plus t bit is uh, 2, 0, 1 m bit is my construction, uh, constructions complex function which we have taken. And here we have assumed that t is actually greater than or equal to 2, okay. But ideally t should be actually greater than or equal to 1, but we will be excluding the case t equal to 1 for now, okay. So we will just consider the case when t is greater than or equal to 2, why? Because if t equal to 1, then this k becomes undefined, right. So therefore we will consider that t is greater than or equal to 2 for this case. So you see that n is actually equal to the size of x and k is equal to n divided by t minus 1 and seal of that and what you do is that for each of these steps you keep on doing certain operations okay so what you do is like this you take so therefore you see that for i equal to 1 to k minus 1 you take xi and assign that to yi so that is the pre processing step okay only the kth block what you do is that you take xk and to the right you pad that with d zeros if you do that, then this also becomes of size t minus 1. Then there is a, an additional step which is actually called 
Markel Damgaard strengthening step. Okay, so therefore this is called MD strengthening. Okay, so what is that MD strengthening step? So what you do is this: that is, you take y k plus one, and in y k plus one, you write the binary representation of d. So d is some value, na? There's some four, five, six, something, right? So you write the binary representation of d, and you pad to the left with zeros. Okay, because you have to make this also of size t minus one. So all the y values are of size t minus one. Okay. So this is the way how you create the y's. Okay. Then what you do is that you start your operation. So what you do, you take the first one. So how many bits are there in y1? T minus one. So you pad that with m plus one zeros. Therefore, its size becomes yeah m plus t plus one because m plus t. It becomes equal to m plus t because there are t minus there are m plus one uh, values here and there are t minus one values here so there are m plus t values here so that means you can feed it to the complex function if you feed it to the complex function it will be give you back an m bit value call that g1 okay so now you continue the iterated process which means that you take gi which is which you have obtained in the previous step and you know you have also obtained yi plus 1 and in between you keep a 1 okay and therefore what is the size of this particular uh, string M plus t. So again, you can feed this into the complex function and obtain an M bit output. Okay. So this you can iterate, and you can obtain the corresponding values like g1, g2, g3, so on, till g k plus one. Okay. So therefore, this final value of g k plus one is actually the hash value. Okay. That is the H x value. So so you note that uh, this. Is a, I mean, sort of a pseudo pseudo algorithm way of representing the story, but diagrammatically this will look like this. Okay, so therefore, what you do is that you take this value of m and then do an additional padding to the kth block, and then finally you add the length block also, which is the y k plus one th block in the pseudo algorithm, and then you are taking each m one, m two, m three, and so on, and this is the i v value. You can, I mean, in my pseudo algorithm, I have taken this to be 0 m plus 1, okay, but that is a public value anyway, okay. So then what you do is that you feed it to the complex function, you obtain an m bit output. You take the next t minus 1, but in between you have to add the 1 here also, and you continue to do that to obtain the corresponding hash value, okay. So all the hash functions like SHA, MD5, MD4, okay, this follows this principle, okay. So now we come to the Slightly middle bit more complicated part, but it's quite simple proof. It says that suppose compress zero one m plus t to zero one m is a collision resistant compressed function, then the function this is actually a collision resistant hash function. Okay, so this is the representation of the collision function. You see that your zero one string can actually write from m plus t plus one to infinity, right? The domain can be zero one, I mean from m plus t plus one to infinity. And that you are compressing to an m bit output. Okay, so what you have to prove is that if this compressed function is a collision resistant function, okay, so if the then then this I mean this is a collision resistant function, then your hash function is also collision resistant. So like the previous day's class, what we have assumed is that you will take a knot in both sides. So therefore, we will show that I mean if we assume that the hash function is not collision resistant, so that means if we assume that there is a Collision which we have obtained for the hash function, then we can prove that the compressed function also has a hash function. I mean, also has a collision. Okay. So if you can find a collision in the hash function efficiently, so efficiently is again under my definition of efficiency, then you can find a collision in the compression function also efficiently. Okay. So how do we prove this? So, so let us uh, in order to prove this, let us. I uh, go back to my algorithm and uh, concentrate upon certain cases. Okay, so so you see that both my algorithms are essentially I've got y1, say y k plus one. Okay, so now assume that you have been able to find out a collision for the hash function. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that you have found out two values or uh, Okay, so if we assume, 
that the hash function has a collision. So, that means that x and x dash which are not the same okay, has got h x and h x dash as same right. We have found out two such values which are like this. So, that means now if you concentrate upon say y 1 I mean I mean concentrate suppose on x and x dash and concentrate upon I mean the two pre-processed steps of x and x dash okay. So, therefore, assume that x results in y and x dash results in y dash okay. So, what is y? y is suppose y 1 to y k plus 1 and y dash is say y 1 dash to y l plus 1 dash okay. So, this can be two arbitrary lengths and based upon which we have done this operation okay. So, now assume two cases case 1 is when mod of x and mod of x dash mod of t minus 1 are not the same okay. So, which means that if you take mod x and mod x dash mod of t minus 1 are not the same okay. So, this is you know that it means that if I take a mod of t minus 1, so there is the final number of values which you are padding. So, there is minus d in both the cases right minus d 1 and minus minus d and minus d dash mainly. So, in this case what I am saying is that d and d dash are not the same right. So, therefore, y k plus 1 and y k plus 1 dash or rather y k y l plus 1 dash are different okay. So, now consider upon the hash output. So, what was my hash string which was outputted? I mean what was my corresponding hash value? H x was equal to g of k plus 1 and H x dash was equal to g of l plus 1 okay. So, call that g dash of l plus 1 okay. So, if H x and H x dash are the same values then g of k plus 1 will be equal to g of l plus 1 dash right. Therefore, what does it mean? It means that compress g of k with 1 with uh, y k plus 1 will be equal to compress g l dash 1 y l plus 1 dash right. So, now we know that y k plus 1 and y l plus 1 dash are different. So, what does it mean? It means that we have been able to find out two values which are giving you the same compressed outputs right. So, therefore, what you are saying showing is that the compressed function is not collision resistant okay. So, this solves one case right. What about the other case now that is, so is this part clear? So, the other case is when mod of x and mod of x dash mod of t minus 1 are same okay. So, this actually we can it, it will be easy if I break this into two parts. So, I call that first part as mod of x the first case is mod of x is equal to mod of x dash. So, which means that what does it imply? it implies that k and l are same values okay. So, now if you observe that what you are saying is g of k plus 1 is equal to g of g dash l plus 1 or rather l will be in this case k itself right. So, g dash of k plus 1. So, what does it mean? It means that compress I call that c o m p for gravity. So, C O M P will be G of k 1 and here we have got y of k plus 1 is equal to C O M P G of k plus 1 rather 1 and y of 
k plus 1 dash ok. So, here you note that y of k plus 1 and y of k dash k plus 1 dash are the same values right. So, what I mean if you say that this is not a collision for the compressed function then definitely g of k and g of k dash should be equal. So, therefore, g of k and g of k dash must be equal right. So, if that be the case then again compress we can continue like this this becomes g of k minus 1 1 y of ok. So, uh, y of uh, k plus uh, y of k and that is equal to of compress g of k minus 1 dash and then you have got your 1 here and y k plus uh, y k dash right. So, so this is the idea right. So, now you see that what do you have. So, if you are still do not want to force the collision of the complex function then two things become clear. One is that y of k and y of k dash must be same right. So, therefore, if this is not a collision then this implies that y of k is equal to y of k dash and g of k minus 1 is equal to g of k minus 1 dash right. So, so now if I assume that g of k minus 1 and g of k dash minus 1 are not the same then again I can continue in this fashion right. So, if I continue and since my lengths are both the same k and l are same I will continue till g 1 equal to g 1 dash right and what in each case you will have a result like this like y k equal to y k dash and again y k minus 1 equal to y k minus 1 dash and similarly finally we have y 1 equal to y 1 dash right. So, what you are saying now is that y and y dash are the same because for each sub part y is have been same in both the cases. So, if y and y dash are the same because my preprocessing step was an injective transformation. So, this implies that x and x dash are the same values, but that contradicts my assumption right because I have assumed that x and x dash are different right. So, therefore, you see a contradiction you follow. So, this part is also solved right. So, therefore, there must be a collision in the in the compressed function ok. So, therefore, you are able to show this reduction right. So, therefore, what about the other case which you have the other part case 2 b is mod of x is not equal to mod of x dash ok. So, this proof is all actually quite similar to the case 2 a except for the fact that you have got g of k plus 1 equal to g of l plus 1 dash right. So, if I assume without loss of generality that l is greater than k ok, then I can continue in this fashion and I can what I will obtain is g of 1 in the final step g of 1 will be equal to g of l minus k plus 1 ok dash. So, what is g 1 and what is g of l minus k plus 1 dash. So, if you see your algorithm here just see your algorithm how it starts. So, the first step is that you take 0 m plus 1 and you concatenate it with y 1 right. So, that is what you are compressing to obtain g 1 right. So, what you are obtaining is 0 of m plus 1 concatenated with y 1 and that is what you are compressing right and what about this this is a simple this is simple like you take uh, g of l minus k concatenate it with y 1 and then you have got y of l minus k plus 1 dash right. So, what about now if you compare these two things you, you observe the m plus first bit ok. The m plus first bit in this case is what y 1 is of how, how, how many bits? is of t minus t minus 1 bits this is of m plus 1 bits ok. How many bits are there in g dash l minus k m bits. So, there is 1 bit here how many bits are there here t minus 1 right. So, now observe the m plus first bit m plus first bit here is 0 
but whatever the m plus first bit here it is 1. So, therefore, they are definitely different right and therefore, you have essentially again found out a collision in the compressed function ok. So, now you see why 1 was used and why 0 m plus 1 plus used right. So, that you understand from the proof actually right. So, this gives you an idea that actually your collision resistance of your compressed function implies that your iterated hash function is also collision resistant ok, right. So, th so, this is again under the ideal assumptions ok. So, we are again assuming that each hash function is an independent computation ok. If you find that there are dependencies in the hash function then all these proof systems will come back. So, now we will just uh, talk about con conclude with the case when t equal to 1 ok. So, I think this part is clear to us ok. So, let us consider the case when t equal to 1. So, when t is equal to 1 that means that you will take a complex function 0 1 m plus 1 to 0 1 m and this is how you do. So, you take x and the preprocessing step is slightly different. So, what you do is that you take 1 1 and after that you take any function f ok and I mean not any function a particular function f and then apply f x 1, f x 2 and so on ok. So, you see that <coughs> mod x means n means what how many bits are there n bits are there for each of the bit you are computing f x 1, f x 2 and so on ok. So, so this is how you do the encoding if, you, if the input is 0 then the output is also 0, but if the input is 1 then the output is 0 1 ok. So, do you understand the encoding? So, therefore, suppose your input is a string like 0 1 0 1 1 like this, then if you are doing this hash encoding f ok, then for your 0 you get 0, for your 1 you get you get 0 1, for your 0 you again get 0, for 1 you get 0 1, for you again 1 you get 0 1. So, this is the way how you are encoding the input x ok. So, now you see that in this case you take this uh, value of x and you start encoding this and the only the thing is that the first two bits are 1 ok. So, why do you keep these two things? Two things are important again the encoding is an injective encoding ok and the other thing is that you there does not exist two strings x and x dash which are different such that y of x and y of x dash satisfy this kind of relation that is y of x is equal to z which is any arbitrary string concatenated with y of x dash. You see that this can never happen so, that is no encoding is a postfix of another encoding. Why? Now, because y of x will obviously start with two ones right and y of x dash will also start with two ones, but in this y x two ones can never occur in between right two successive ones can never occur in between. So, therefore, this this relation will never be satisfied do you follow do you follow no ok. So, so what I am saying is that if you take two values of x and x dash there can never be a case where y of x dash and y of x dash satisfies this relation that is y of x is I mean y of x dash is a post fix of another encode ok because of the reason that two consecutive ones can never occur in the preprocessed step ok. Then it is quite simple so therefore you obtain this y 1 and then what you do is that you take so each of them are of now of 1 bit. So, what you do is that you take 0 m I mean m bits and this is of y 1 is of 1 bit. So, that is m plus 1 bit you compress you obtain g 1 you continue this process ok. So, you take g i and contain concatenate it with y i i plus 1. So, g i is m, m bits and y i plus 1 is 1 bit. So, this is m plus 1 bit you engage this compressed function which gives you an m bit output from an m plus 1 bit output and obtain an m bit output and finally, you are returning g k as the corresponding hash value ok. So, now this we can actually also show to be collision resistant 
and the proof is quite very simple. I will not go into the details of the proof. You can follow, find it out, the, find, the, find out the details from Simpson's book. The reason is that the, I mean, if you, the, again, you can divide into two cases, okay. So, you again assume that there is a collision for the, compre, uh, collision for the hash function, which means that there are two x values, x and x dash, which are distinct and which results in the same hashed outputs, okay. So, now, you again assume that x and x dash, the sizes are same or the sizes are different, okay. So, if the sizes are different, then the proof is exactly, I mean, if the sizes are same, then the proof is exactly same. If the sizes are same, then again you can assume that gk equal to g, gl dash and similarly you can again continue and show that y and y dash will be same and you can continue in that fashion, okay. But what about the other case when the sizes are not the same, okay. So, if the sizes are not the same, then you will actually have, you, you will actually show that, so if you, if the sizes are not the same, which means if I assume that the size in one case is k and the size in another case is l and they are not the same, okay. So, what you do is that you uh, continue from y k and, uh, okay, so you start with g k and g l, okay, g, g l dash. So, if g k and g l dash are the same because you are assuming that the hash function collides with for two x values, x and x dash, then g k equal to g l dash means what? g k equal to g l dash means that correspondingly y k plus 1 will be equal to y of l plus 1 dash, okay. So, similarly you can continue and finally you will have y 1 equal to y of l minus k plus 1 dash, okay. So, now this means that you are violating the post fix assumption because here you have got one string which is actually the post fix of the other string. So, you see that this is a shorter string and this is a bigger string for y's. Do you see that? that this, is a, this is a y string in one case and this is a y string in another case and this actually forms a post part of, of I mean this is actually a bigger string, right. So, therefore, you can if you consider y dash, you can write y dash as some z which is followed by a y y string, right. So, therefore, this is actually violating my property of the encoding function, okay. So, therefore, this cannot happen. So, therefore, there must be a, so therefore, again you are proving a contradiction, I mean showing a contradiction and this is establishes the fact that if the compressed function is collision resistant, then your hash function is also collision resistant, okay. So, this is what the theorem says and if you, if you, I mean put the two theorems together, then now you have actually got t greater than equal to 1 because the previous case was t greater than equal to 2 and this case is equal to t equal to 1. So, this is what you have showed that, that if the compressed function is a collision resistant compressed function, then so is the hash function, okay. And you can actually compute the number of times the compressed is computed in each of the cases and this works out as follows, okay. These are quite simple calculations if you can just check how many times the compressed functions are being, are being engaged, okay. So, this is an assignment for you again. So, therefore, you see that consider a collision resistant function g x which takes an infinite string and and uh, results in a 0 1 n bit output, okay. Consider a hash function h x which is 1 concatenated with x if x is of n bits, otherwise it is 0 concatenated with g x, okay. So, now you see, I mean the question is that you have to discuss about the collision and the pre image resistance of x of h x. So, you see that since g x is collision resistant, h x is also collision resistant, okay. But what about the pre image problem? You see that in one case you have found out that there is a 1 as an output, right. So, therefore, if I assume that 50 percent of time you will get 1 and 50 percent of time you will get 0, if you get 1 concatenated with x, then x is I mean the, the inverse is so, so clear, right. So, with the probability of at least 50 percent, you are able to invert the function h x. So, what does it mean? This is not pre image resistant, but what have we proved? We have proved that collision resistance implies pre image resistance. So, where is the anomaly? So, there is a small problem in this particular example from what we have proved in the class, okay. So, you are supposed to justify that, okay. So, next time we will again continue with the hash function. And this is the textbook that we have followed and this is some paper that I have followed. 
So this is the main book. You can refer to this textbook. You will find these details there. Okay. So we will again continue with cryptographic hash functions next time.